is the DeFi Decoded Podcast by Nine Point Partners. The ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast should not be taken as investment advice. Always consult with your financial advisor before investing. Hello and welcome back to another episode of DeFi Decoded. I am Alex Tapscott. Andrew Young is off today. Andrew and I often talk about crypto as a freedom enabling technology. The idea that you have you know, a medium of exchange and a store of value that you can actually control yourself and send peer to peer. And there's lots of interesting business opportunities and applications that can be built on top, on top of that. But fundamentally, the core sort of principle of this technology and really its origin is in enabling, um, you know, personal freedom, um, freedom from the state, freedom from uh, corporations and so on and so forth. And I think that that's something that today is a a concept that's more powerful and and more timely than ever before. Um, You know, we live in a world where billions of people uh, live in places where you know the financial system is under underdeveloped, or where the local currency is hyperinflationary, or where the financial system is perhaps corrupted, or even where the government is corrupt as well. And um, I think the time is uh, you know no more urgent than ever for this kind of technology. So we have the perfect guest to kind of talk through this. Um, Alex Gladstein is the chief strategy officer of the Human Rights Foundation. He's someone who I've spoken to before in the past, including interviewing for my recent book. And he's probably someone who can describe this challenge and opportunity a lot more eloquently than I can. So very grateful to have you on the show, Alex. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Okay, so let's maybe just start off with the Human Rights Foundation. So tell us about that. What is that organization? What does it do? In the mid-2000s, there was a crisis in Venezuela where Hugo Chavez was very popular, but he was committing a lot of human rights violations. He was eroding democracy. He was silencing journalists. A lot of red flags in terms of how he was going after the legislative branch, the judicial branch, press freedom. And a lot of the big human rights groups kind of held their tongue on this because, you know, Chavez was popular because he was anti George W. Bush. America was not very popular at the time globally. And this was an issue for Venezuelans. So our founder, Thor Halverson, who's a Venezuelan, he started the Human Rights Foundation so that the world would have a human rights group that was focused on authoritarian regimes. Uh, and that's what HREP does. So we look at, it's cl- probably sadly close to 95 countries constituting about 5.7 billion people, which is, um, you know, close to 70% of the world's population who live under some sort of authoritarian regime, some sort of autocratic regime where, you know, there's no real kind of uh, uh, civil society, free speech. There's not really a whole lot of separation of powers. There's not really a fair playing field for opposition political parties. It's very hard to criticize the government or expose corruption in any meaningful way. And that's, that's just the reality of life for most people on earth. So we exist to help individuals in those countries who are promoting freedom, democracy, human rights. And the rest of our team is, is it really quite global? Our chairman is Gary Kasparov, the Russian chess grandmaster. The president, her name is Celine uh, Bustani. She's from Lebanon. We have different kind of legal experts from East Asia, the Middle East, Latin America. So we're a very global organization. A lot of our work is straight advocacy for people. We do legal advocacy. We do trainings. We make grants. We try to help people. We give them a platform to speak at the Oslo Freedom Forum, which is our which is our flagship conference that happens in Norway every year. And we also run a variety of kind of themed programs. We have an art and human rights program. We have a digital security program and we have a financial freedom program. And that's the one I'm most involved with these days. And it's uh, basically looking at how activists around the world have, have used Bitcoin as a freedom tool. And we learn from them. And in exchange, we try to give back and educate others about Bitcoin's role as a freedom tool. And we do trainings with activists, journalists, helping them learn how to understand Bitcoin safely and securely. And we also give grants. So we give about a half million dollars every quarter to open source initiatives around the world, doing Bitcoin education, UX, core development, 
all privacy improvements, anything that would make Bitcoin a better tool for human rights. So that's mm-hmm. basically the uh, the story there. I've been doing this work at HREP for about 17 years, started in 2007, and really started doing the Bitcoin work in early 2017. That's when we started doing our first official programming around this. Um, we had noticed Bitcoin way beforehand. Julian Assange spoke at our conference in 2010. I met him in person. One year later, he posted a Bitcoin address to the WikiLeaks Twitter account. The rest is history. We 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 noticed Ukrainian activists using Bitcoin in 2013. We'd started taking donations in 2014. Bitcoin's been very good to us. So we're just trying to give back. Yeah, interesting. When I spoke to you last, you told me that in the human rights and politics camp, finance and money are rarely discussed, but they're very important. And I think that a lot yeah. of people think about you know authoritarian regimes as suppressing speech right? The freedom of expression, the ability of people to, you know, voice opposition. Um, but it also uh, extends to to money and to, to finance. And, you know, if you can't pay for, uh, you know, acts of opposition, then you can't really, you know, be an effect. You can't really mobilize people. You can't like fight back, right? And, and yeah. try and change, right? So talk about the money part, like 2017, um, I'm actually surprised it was that late in a way, you know, Bitcoin has, had been around since 2008, it wasn't really used. Mm-hmm. Couple years later, but 2017 is is um, in the context of this sort of narrative a bit later. So, like, what tell us maybe just about the the Bitcoin journey specifically? Like, how did it? How is it that you first heard about it? And then yeah. also, when did um, HRF started to to really um, like the 2017? What happened then that uh, that changed for you? Well, I think we just noticed that. I mean, just kept kept kind of popping up, and I think people should remember that Bitcoin was very fringe in 2011, 12, 13, 14. Like it was not something that you could hang your hat on. It had a tremendous amount of risk. It had way less risk than today. Its price was way lower. There was all the Silk Road stuff going on, Mount Gox. Like it just was, it was, it was just a little harder pill to swallow for a lot of people at that time. But even still, I mean, we saw it be effective and we were interest, interested by that. That's why we started doing programming around it and started um, accepting donations in it. W- when I mentioned early 2017, that, that's when I, me personally, at least, I started to really start to click for me that it wasn't just some sort of interesting internet phenomenon, but something that um, it's actually going to be really key for the struggle for human rights. So that's in, the, in April 2017, that's when we put together our first uh, actual kind of workshop between human rights activists and Bitcoin builders. Um, it was just, everything's gone from there. Obviously that was a very interesting time in Bitcoin land. Uh, the price had just broken a thousand dollars and then it just had broken $2,000 while we were at the conference. So people were getting excited after a very long bear market. Um, and then obviously the next year was totally crazy. Um, but in general, we saw repeatedly how, organizations were getting their bank accounts frozen and how people were being restricted from transacting and making payroll and how nonprofits every in so many countries were having a lot of trouble receiving donations, paying out translators and staff. And over time, we realized that this Bitcoin is going to be such a good infrastructure for this. And that's what it started to become for so many organizations today. So you, you I mean, some of these groups have been using Bitcoin for, for a while. So if you look at uh, the Anti-Corruption Foundation, which is Alexei Navalny's organization in, in Russia, they started accepting Bitcoin, I believe, in 2016. If you look at Roya Mahbub, who's been training, uh, doing education for women and girls in Afghanistan, she's been using it since 2013. So there are, there are some groups that have been using it for a while. But in the last like three, four years, we've seen a, a total explosion of, of nonprofits um, seeking Bitcoin grants or using Bitcoin internally. Um, ever since a few years ago, when we give a grant, we, we, we ask, I mean, do you want a bank wire or do you want Bitcoin? And if you're in Gabon, like you don't want a bank wire. <laughs> like, like not only do you lose a huge amount of money on the Forex part of it on the exchange, typically, in a lot of these countries, there's like a black market and a official rate of exchange and when you make a bank wire to for example nigeria you lose 40 percent of the value of the transaction whereas with a bitcoin transaction you keep all your value um there's like the really important thing that if you use the banking system 
to support someone inside a dictatorship, the government knows, which is often bad because they are already illegal. Like people are like worried about breaking the law. No, no, no. These organizations are already illegal. Like their the very existence is illegal. Right. So the idea that we can do a peer-to-peer non-KYC transaction for them is pretty life-saving. Now on our side, it's KYC because we're a 501c3 and we have to announce to our, to the, you know, we're, we're a charity. So, you know, we need to know who we're giving money to, but the dictatorship doesn't have to know. So this, this remains very important to people living under occupation, to people living under dictatorship, to people living in a country where they don't have an ID, where they're like a refugee. Uh, this technology is just so, so critical. Yeah. Um, do you have any way of quantifying how many charity charitable organizations are using it today? Or even maybe just a sense of the total market of people that yeah. are well, for, the, I, for this purpose? I'll give an example. In 2009, very, very few activists used encrypted messaging. Um, you know, something like a signal hadn't really taken off. I would say, right. I mean, really, it was like PGP and stuff. I mean, it was like clunky. So I would say, based on my experience, that less than 5% of global activists were really encrypting anything in 2009. Then 10 years later, in 2019, I mean, it was probably 95% of activists had access to knowledge of were using something like Signal. So it took about 10 years, and it, it really, you know, we ran the gamut. So with Bitcoin, I would I would start that clock somewhere around you know, 2020 and we're like less than 5% for sure. And I think by the end of the decade, it's going to be almost everybody. And I think now you're, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's 10 to 15% of the groups that I'm working with or seen um, are, are using it or intrigued or are trying to use it, learning about it. The great majority still aren't. Um, but, but there's a, there's a certainly growing critical mass here. Um, and, and again, we're not, I mean, this is a voluntary technology. You can't force anyone to use it, um, nor should you. Uh, but what we try to do is we try to tell people, Hey, look, if you need money that the government doesn't control (laughs) and these groups are like, what? Yes. Tell me more. (laughs) Then, then, then we're happy to teach. We're happy to educate. We're happy to do best practices. We can do that through free public education. We, we make a lot of videos, books, uh, uh, articles, essays, talks at conferences, but we also do specific tailored hands-on training, you know, private training sessions where we teach people how to set up a wallet, how to receive Bitcoin, how to back up the seed phrase, how to delete the wallet, how to recover it, um, best practices for on and off ramp for fiat currency, how to, how to interact with stable coins if necessary, um, how to protect privacy, the whole thing. Um, and then, and then again, we do the grants as well, but, um, you know, that, that's, I think a good, 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 good sense of where we are is, you know, probably in that 10 to 15% range. And I really think we'll be close to most, most folks in the space by the end of the decade, whether they be environmentalists, labor leaders, journalists, human rights activists. I mean, there's just going to be a great need for a money that cannot be devalued and cannot be deplatformed. That's just totally blindingly obvious to me. I love that. Not not devalued, not deplatformed. And you also said something that was really interesting, which is that it's a voluntary technology. And you know what's yeah. interesting about voluntary technologies is that anyone can use them. Um, it, you could be someone who's yeah. on banks. You could be a charity. Um, you could be a, a criminal or potentially a terrorist, right? And yeah. I and I raise this because today, like, there's no discourse about how 15 percent of charities are using this, how women in Afghanistan are using it or how- Yeah, no one wants to tell, no, no, no one, one wants, wants to, to talk tell. about the good side. No, so but what, what they are talking about right now is Hamas, right? And, you know, this isn't a politics show, but I'm just curious, like, why is it that um, the narrative around, you know, it's like ISIS probably uses email or WhatsApp, but, you know, it's like, why is it that um, <laughs> they seem to be- Probably, st- you can bet your bottom uh, dollar, dude, that they're using crypto well, messaging. Of course, um, of course. But so, it's like, why is it that why is it that uh, it seems to be the narrative always shifts towards for one thing and not the other? I mean, like, what's your what's your view on that? There's inertia in society. I mean, you saw this with the rise of the internet and the rise of encryption generally. I mean, when Phil Zimmerman invented PGP and created a way for two computer users to trade a secret message, they tried they tried to arrest him. I mean, they 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 went in front of a court and 
they tried to say that he was exporting munitions. I mean, it's completely crazy. This was all happened in the early 90s. And thankfully, the, the, the President Clinton, Senator Biden, they all wanted to outlaw privacy on the Internet. Thankfully, they lost. Um, and now we have e-commerce and we have the ability to encrypt like financial information and we have signal and now the chief spook of the NSA, um, the former chief spook uh, has said, Michael Hayden has said that uh, it's an American right to encrypt. Well, I mean, that was a culture war, right? That, that took, you know, 20 years for people to figure out that this was actually really core to America's values that you'd want privacy in communications, that this is not bad. And that in fact, what is bad is surveillance. Like, like we've been, you know, there's so much propaganda out there post 9-11, if you go back two decades. I mean, the government wanted you to think that the Patriot Act, they wanted you to think that surveillance was good and privacy was bad. That's how twisted it got. And that's that's going to happen with Bitcoin. It already is. I mean, the government is trying to basically tell you that Bitcoin's bad and that, you know, government debt is safe and surveillance is good and privacy is dangerous. I mean, that's what the whole construct of the Bank Secrecy Act and all this stuff is. So we're going to have to fight this again. I think it's going to be a tougher fight, actually. Um, but the reality is the mainstream media has no has demonstrated no interest in exploring the full potential of Bitcoin. They regularly hate on Bitcoin. Um, we, we did some internal studies of like media between 2013-ish range and 2022 just a, you know, a decade in the media. I mean, it was kind of shocking. Like some of these news outlets, Washington Post, New York Times, whatever. I mean, they would be like at 90, 95% negative stories on Bitcoin. Uh, I, I, I presume that doesn't shock anybody, but um, no. Surprise, it's you know, <laughs> it, it, when in reality, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, um, if you look at, and there's just so much FUD, like the Hamas thing is a perfect example. So they come out, the, new, the all the newspapers, oh, like Hamas is, is surviving because of cryptocurrency. Um, turns out, no, that's not the case at all. In fact, the stated amount that they claimed that Hamas raised through this, the actual amount was like 1% of that, according to chain analysis, which, by the way, is like part of the national security industry in the United States. So just like, quantify that for us. So like, I think the stated number was a few million. It was like 80 million, which is million. a lot because, okay, so Hamas's annual budget is probably like a billion dollars. It's like somewhere in the range of 800 to 800 million to a billion dollars. So yeah, sure. If they had 83 million in Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, and I, I think they were acute, they were basically saying it was stable coins, but like, okay, well, that would be significant. Well, yeah, it turns out that it's like 1% of that or something like that. So like these numbers that people run with are so insane. Yeah. And here's the deal with, with all of the crime stuff right now. It is a really bad idea to do large scale crime with Bitcoin or, or certainly with stable coins. Um, it, it's trackable uh, to, the, to the point of on-ramp or off-ramp. So while it makes for an awesome tool for small transactions, your privacy can be effectively hidden, especially if you do not attach your ID to it. It makes for a really great tool for smaller grants, supporting activists, remittances, support for refugees as an economic development tool, payroll for small, small organizations. This can, be, this can be done without state knowledge pretty well because the amounts that you're on and off ramping are small. They're like individuals selling a couple hundred bucks to make ends meet or whatever. But if you're like a state entity, like a dictatorship or a billion dollar organization like Hamas, I mean, you need to be moving 50, 100 million dollars of Bitcoin at a time to make a difference. Good luck doing that without some sort of tracking, right? Like that's very, very hard to do. Hmm. Like even OTC markets eventually have, I mean, eventually you need to get, because at the end of the day, the person selling you weapons is not accepting other like like you know aside from like navy and ukraine that was happening for a few months at the beginning of the war um that's not really happening so they're gonna they're gonna want cold hard cash they don't want your cryptocurrency so you have to exit and and you have to have a bank account and guess what the idf the israeli defense forces are pretty good at tracking bitcoin they're not so good at tracking cash gold and qatari bank accounts so I just thought the whole thing was so dumb. Um, and it highlights the fact that the mainstream media will jump at any time to expose any sort of possibly negative story about Bitcoin 
while completely ignoring the vast, incredible impact it's having on the world around them. And I think that these journalists are going to, there's going to be a reckoning in 10 years where they're going to have egg on their face big time. Yeah. Interesting. You've raised the, a couple things in the last two answers, stable coins, tether, um, you know, we're talking about Bitcoin, but one of the things that seems to be getting a lot of attra attra um, traction and adoption, including in a lot of the places that where HFR does a lot of work are us dollar stable coins. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, we talked about this a little bit the last time we spoke, but you know, there are certain attributes of stable coins that are similar to Bitcoin, but others that are not right. Um, you know, something that yeah. can be valued or deplatformed. Well, if collateral is held inside of a financial institution and a government decides to do something to that institution, <laughs> yeah, it coins, goes to zero. <laughs> yeah. The stable coin yeah. is censorable, right. In some ways, maybe not peer to peer, but the whole construct is censorable uh, versus say like Bitcoin, which is totally separate. Well, but Tether has black. No, Tether and Circle have blacklists. The, 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 these, these technologies are very different. They're centralized. They have an issuer who could get their, like, as you point out. Who could, I know, but, but at the same time, so like I, but I'm at the same time, they're also, they have also helped people to store value in dollars and the, help the, prevent from devaluation. Yeah. And so the, I'm just wondering like, it's some nuance to it. So how do you think about stable? Coins? No, I mean, the reason why stable coins are useful is because they're permissionless. The reason why they're useful is they do not require KYC to use. So it's basically regulatory arbitrage, but like my view is that we live in a currency caste system. There's 180 currencies. Only the top handful are worth, worth, worth are, are like, you know, worthwhile, are valuable in that sense. The rest are collapsing well, you know, at various rates of rep. Yeah. Yeah. The rest are just not even accepted. It's not just that they're, they have high rates of inflation. They're not if you're funded. Ghana, <laughs> if you have, even if you're Brazil, like you can't use your currency to buy like fertilizer or weapons or oil or whatever. Like you have to go get dollars or euros or something. So these are second rate, second class currencies. So in that world, of course, it makes sense that everybody should have access to the dollar. Yeah. That is, that's only fair. That's what stable coins are making possible because you can basically hold a dollar asset on your phone without an ID. Yeah. Um, that is awesome. I don't think, I think it's a huge humanitarian innovation. I don't think it really has anything to do with Bitcoin. It's like a totally different technology. It has shares very little with Bitcoin other than that it's a digital currency, um, but it, it functions very differently, but you know, it also has different benefits um, and the risks are very different. I mean, again, these things can get frozen. The whole thing could go under in a day. Um, but in general, people need to realize that they're popular because they are non KYC mobile wallet dollars. I mean, now a lot of them trade on centralized platforms. So, you know, there's not a huge, huge amount of people like self custing. <laughs> I mean, you know, obviously you have a good amount of Met MetaMask users and some other things, but like, you know, the, the majority of people that I interact with who use these things, they're not self custodying even. I mean, even if that word is somewhat hollow with a stable coin, because even if you're self custodying, it's still good. You can still get rugged. Um, it's not like Bitcoin, but you know, a lot of people are using like Binance or whatever. Um, so I don't know. I, I think that, you know, I think the right perspective is to acknowledge the power of stable coins, acknowledge how much they help people, um, but also be very aware of the risks. Like these things could could go to zero. Um, they can be frozen, uh, and, and and people should just make those choices accordingly. I mean, there are platforms you can go to on the internet. I'm not going to name them here. But like basically, you know, we want to make sure our the users of Bitcoin that we're interacting with understand that obviously Bitcoin's volatile. So if they want to hedge into dollars, there are websites you can go to and you can send your Bitcoin, obviously, at your risk. I mean, you could lose it all, but you could send a bit of your Bitcoin and receive some tether in return without ID. You can do this. This is like very, 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 very pop, very popular. Yeah. Um, it's done on Telegram groups in Ukraine. There's all different ways of doing it. And these are people who can't get digital dollars. Like they don't have a dollar bank account. Um, but, you know, maybe it makes sense for them to hedge their Bitcoin with stables or whatever. So, you know, we want to be empathetic to that for sure. Yeah. What I meant was not that they're similar in sort of their design, but rather that in the, in the, in the outcome, like the fact that if they both uh, help people to um, store value and, you know, have access uh -huh. to services, and maybe even to fund movements that are difficult to fund otherwise. And they're similar in that respect. Not, not that they're mm -hmm. similar. So like I- Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. That's we're true. We're agreeing. I just kind of wanted to clarify. 
um, my question a little bit. You've talked a little bit in the past about um, the golden billion. And I think that sounds sort of similar to what you were talking about with the caste system. Like there's this billion mm -hmm. world where um, I guess it's, it's, it's kind of the same as the currency caste system because the golden billion are in places like Canada, the US, Europe, Japan. Is that basically it? Like there are places in the it's, world. Where... Well, it's basically two things. It's, it's do you, are you born into a reserve currency and are you born into a, a liberal democracy that respects property rights? Right. That's about a billion people so to speak, maybe a little yeah. more, but roughly about a billion people. Everybody else, the other 7 billion, they either live under a, a, a terrible currency or a, a, some sort of authoritarian government. Yeah. So the total addressable market, you know, for, for, for a currency that can't be frozen and can't be debased is at least 7 billion people. Yeah. So <laughs> we're going to get there. I mean, we're going to get there. I mean, people aren't dumb. They just, they just, Bitcoin is so weird and alien and the educational material just isn't out there and governments hate it. And they're going to try to steer their population away from it. And the media is going to try and say it's evil and stupid and dangerous. And it's a hard learning curve. And yeah. the UX isn't perfect yet by any means. We're, we're still kind of in the dial up phase of Bitcoin, like, you know, using your dial up modem. But you know what? I was back there as a teenager in the nineties using my dial up modem, even though it had terrible UX and sucked. The internet was awesome and it was very clear to me that we weren't like going back, right? Like as a kid in the mid nineties, dialing up on the internet, we're not not having the internet. And that's how I feel about Bitcoin. Like, yes, the UX is clunky and only some people are using it and it seems a little bit weird, but we're not going backwards. That's not going to yeah. happen. You know, this is, yeah. this is, I mean, the best way to describe it to somebody is basically like, well, we used to all mail each other stuff in the post, right? And that was what we did. And then we developed like the telegram and then eventually we developed like email, right? Okay, so you're obviously going to use email because it's faster and better for like the great majority of communications versus post, right? Okay, well, that's not an ideological or a political thing. We don't care about the ideology of the people who created email. We're just going to use email because it's better. That's what's going to happen with Bitcoin. Yeah. It is such an upgrade on the bank wire for most things that we're going to end up using it to do international transactions and to do particular kinds of movements of funds in our financial system. And it won't be a political thing. No one's going to care about Satoshi's views on X. Like, who cares? Like, I'm not going to go back to using, I'm not going to go back to mailing a letter in the mail. The, the idea of the bank wire is the most dinosaur technology. I mean, once you've done a Bitcoin transaction abroad, you're never going to do a bank wire. It's completely ridiculous. So um, I think that's where we're headed. Yeah, interesting. You know, Alex, I think that you should write an op-ed. Um, and I think you should try <laughs> and do it in the next seven days. Because, okay. you know, there's a prevailing, uh, you, this is the perfect time to do it. Because there's mm -hmm. this point of view that, um, you know, Bitcoin is something that empowers terrorists, basically. And that's, yeah. that's, that's the narrative. And yeah. someone needs to say, um, the, the other side of it. And it's like, you know, look, this is a technology that's being used by the hundreds of charitable organizations to help people in need in places where it's hard to get the money. And it's being used by people who don't otherwise have access to financial services. So I will, and, I will, you know, I will do you one where, better. Yeah. What do you got? I'll do you one better. Um, I rewrote the op-ed for time magazine. Um, it, it came out, uh, Right when the sort of white supremacist movement was was really heating up, remember like Nick Fuentes, like all these crazy people were getting these Bitcoin donations. This was uh, yeah. in January 2021, very, and very I just I just sent you the link. So if you, if, you, if listeners want to check it out, they can read it. It's called "In the Fight Against Extremism: Don't Demonize Surveillance Busting Tools Like Signal and Bitcoin." And basically, it's my argument about you know why if we want to protect democracy, we have to have these things. We have to have privacy of communication and privacy of transaction. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where I lay out my argument, you know, but at the end of the day, you do have to realize, like, if you're really a, if you're a Bitcoin bull, like if you think that this thing's going to continue eating away at the global financial system, if you think this is going to be a big part of the world in 10 years, if you think it could potentially be a reserve currency, then you have to understand that everybody's going to use it just like with encryption and the internet and email and phones and things like that. So 
ultimately, if you think Bitcoin's going to be successful, it means all the good guys and all the bad guys are going to use it. So that's just something that you need to square with yourself. That's just going to, if Bitcoin is successful, that's going to happen. Yeah. So let's just prepare accordingly. Yeah. But I think that's a message that's definitely getting lost in the fog of war and people taking advantage of the moment to push whatever political agenda they have. So maybe just re resurface the, uh, the op-ed, retweet it. Yeah, um, I'll post it today. You know, honestly, like, I think that's a message that deserves to be heard. And, and thank you for sharing it on the show today. Um, what a great conversation, Alex. We wish you the best of luck. Um, how can people learn more about what you're up to? Yeah, well, you can visit href.org to check out the work of the Human Rights Foundation. I've got a couple of books out there. One is called Check Your Financial Privilege. One is called Hidden Repression. Both are out on Amazon. Um, and you can also follow me on social at Gladstein. Thank yeah. you for having me. Thank you. And the uh, op-ed that Alex is referring to, the title is In the Fight Against Extremism, Don't Demonize Surveillance Busting Tools Like Signal and Bitcoin for Time Magazine, written about a year and a half ago. So really fortunate to have you on the show today, Alex. Thanks again. That's, uh, that's it for this week's episode. We'll see everyone next week. Take care. The information contained herein does not constitute an offer or solicitation by anyone in the United States or in any other jurisdiction in which such an offer or solicitation is not authorized or to any person to whom it is unlawful to make such an offer or solicitation. Prospective investors who are not residents in Canada should contact their financial advisor to determine whether securities of the funds may be lawfully sold in their jurisdiction.